Good morning, church. If God's been good to you, say amen. amen. We serve a good God, a very good God. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Jason, for leading and singing. Thank you, Isaac, for doing the Lord's Supper and men for serving. It's an exciting time to be here together and to be with the Lord's Church. We bring you greetings from the churches in Nikiski and Anchor Point and Homer, and your brothers and sisters there send their love to you. And it's an exciting thing to be a part of God growing his church. Today's lesson, we're going to be looking at John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, the, the wedding at Cana, as it has been titled. It's important, though, as we dive into this lesson to understand that the scriptures written through the Apostle John are very specifically designed for people like most of you here, people that believe in God, that are disciples of Jesus already. You see, the Gospels, the four Gospels, have a different recipient in mind as they were written. Matthew was written for the Jews. Luke was written for the Gentiles. Mark was written for the Romans. And John was written for Christians. You see, it's really interesting looking at the history of the church, and specifically the first century and the things that took place because Jesus began his ministry in the year 30, uh, approximately, and died in 33 AD. And then the first book of the New Testament that was written then was the book of James, or the letter from James, in 50 AD. And then between 50 and 68, everything of the New Testament was written, even the book of Revelation, except for the Gospel of John and the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Those were written in about 85 to 90 is when the Gospel was written, and then 95-ish is when the letters were written. So this is one of the last um, books of the Bible to be written for that 1st century church. Um, over, over 50 years after Jesus died and resurrected and ascended into heaven, this then was written. So generations have gone by people that had not seen Jesus themselves, but their parents or their grandparents had, had seen Jesus and heard his teachings. And so this is something from one of his apostles, someone who ended up taking Jesus' mother as his own mother to live with him after Jesus died and had a closeness, a proximity to Jesus because there was a lot of false teaching starting to pop up everywhere. And this was coming from someone who was inspired, someone who, was, who had walked with Jesus and was a disciple of his from the beginning. And so we're going to look at some really interesting things that God writes to us through John. And the first thing we have to understand is just like what was read for us um, by Daniel here in John 20, verses 30 through 31, is that Jesus did a lot of stuff. He did a lot of signs and miracles and a lot of lessons and sermons and teachings and, and did so much. But these things that are written... In the book of John specifically are given to us with a purpose, trying to teach us something, trying to show Christians something. These are written that we may believe and understand that through Jesus we can have eternal life. So the things written to us through John are for us to be encouraged, for us to be confident, and for us to have clarity of what is truth. These signs that Jesus did, it's also important to understand that they were entirely public. They were not something that he went into a cave and had this experience and came back and just shared what he saw. It wasn't just some enlightenment that was downloaded into him. But the miracles and these signs that he performed, they were done in front of crowds. And you could go and talk to people, hey, were you there when this happened? Like, yeah, I ate some of the bread that he made. Or with the thousands of people that were there. Or in like today's lesson, yeah, I was at the wedding and you wouldn't believe what happened. Actually, you would believe because we recorded it. 
Um, so I want uh, to highlight here that in the book of John, um, Jesus does quite a few miraculous things, but there's seven signs that get um, selected for us to be um, to pay attention to. And out of the things that Jesus did, God uses John to select these signs for us to believe the things that Jesus said and to believe that um, he is the source of life. So the first one is turning water into wine, which is going to be our main focus this morning. Jesus also heals the official son, makes the lame to walk. He walks on water. He feeds the multitudes. He gives sight to the blind, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. And so these seven are those that are showcased to us as, um, as God presents them in the book of John. But uh, as we look at the wedding at Cana, if we look at Jesus turning the water into wine, I want to give a brief warning, and I don't want to come across too harsh, but I want to warn against shallowness because I have I have encountered several times throughout traveling and teaching and speaking with people that uh, this passage in John chapter 2, I've heard it used as an argument for the drinking of alcohol. And I caution you with that if that is where your mind is going, thinking of this chapter, to go deeper, to think more about what's taking place in this chapter because this is written for us to believe in Jesus and to believe that in him there is life. And there's plenty of other passages talking about the drinking and consumption of alcohol, but this passage is written for us for a purpose, and it's a sign pointing to something. And for us to, to not look at just the surface level of things going on here, but to go deep and to think, okay, what is the message here? What does this mean for us as Christians, because it's written to people like you and me, people who want to believe Jesus, want to follow him. So let's make sure that we're not shallow and looking at this passage, but we're trying to look at the big picture. What is Jesus trying to show us by doing this? So let's look at what has been done for us. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. If you have your Bibles, turn over to there. This is where we're going to be for the majority of this morning, and so at the very least bookmark it because we will be coming back for sure. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Before we go any further, uh, I would like to just make a cultural footnote that in Jesus' response to Mary in saying mother, that wasn't derogatory or negative in any sort, form, or fashion. In our culture, calling someone woman, like woman, make me a sandwich, like that's kind of, uh, you know, that's not very polite and Christ-like. Um, and Jesus saying woman, it was a cultural um, expression. When he's on the cross, he says, woman, behold your son, talking about John there at the, at the end of his life. Um, and so the expression woman is not, um, is not negative in any way. So again, just clarifying that. Now there were six stone, stone water jars there for the Jewish rites a purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. 
This is the first sign Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So let's begin to process what just happened and what we just read and what is being communicated to us. The first is that we need to understand that this is taking place in the context of marriage. Love is in the air. There's a wedding going on, and that's an important aspect to understand about uh, what and why um, things are things are happening. Who made marriage? It wasn't it wasn't something man came up with. We're involved in it, but it's not the way. It's not something we just uh, uh, created. God created and instituted marriage. It's it's from His design. So we're dealing with the stuff God has made. God uses the relationship of marriage so much in scripture to represent his dynamic with his people. You could look at Hosea. You could look at many of the parables of Jesus. You could look at what the apostles wrote about the church being the bride of Christ. All through the Bible, the relationship covenant of marriage, the institution that God made of marriage, God holds up and says, this is like me and my people, or rather me and my people are like marriage. And so he uses it as a template, as an analogy, as an example of God and his people is like husband and wife. In fact, Paul in Ephesians 5, verses 31 through 32, he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's quoting Genesis here. And then he says, This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And I always find this passage interesting and, and almost hilarious because Paul is so educated. He, was, he studied under Gamaliel. He was, a, he was a Pharisee. He was inspired. He saw Jesus after he ascended. He saw Jesus multiple times. He actually ended up going to heaven and having visions and having all these experiences. And if anyone was to understand great mysteries and to have insight that I could not even comprehend, that's not Jesus. It, in my mind, it would be Paul and the things that he says is a profound mystery is the connection between marriage and the connection between God and his church. And so this idea of husband and wife, of headship, of love and respect, of submission, um, unconditionally, covenant relationship meant to last for life. These things are a profound mystery. There's so much dynamic to this connection. And so this is the type of scenario in which Jesus performs this sign. It's a wedding. There's something happening where two are becoming one for life. And it is extremely godly. So always keep this marriage context in mind as we're looking through this sign in John chapter 2. So let's look at what Mary said to Jesus, um, or to the servants, rather, about Jesus. He, she tells the servants there to do whatever he tells you. So the, the crisis at the wedding here is that they are running out of wine, and um, I was laughing and preparing this because I was just thinking that, oh, it's biblical for weddings not to go completely according to plan. You know, every wedding went, without, went off without a hitch, right? It's just everything happened smoothly. There's no stress involved. It's just, you know, a very turnkey operation. Um, no, weddings can be stressful. Uh, but we see here that with God present, the wedding ends up becoming much better than anyone expected or imagined. So they ran out of wine, and that was quite the crisis for the culture at this time. Um, but Mary's response to this situation and her um, suggestion to the servants is awesome. And it is so, a, so, such a good example for us as his disciples to think of this mentality. Do whatever he asks of you, or to do whatever he tells you. 
So how good are you at following directions? Some of us are better at it than others. I want to tell you a story. Um, about 10 years ago, I had a roommate. I just started the AIM program, and my roommate name was Andrew. And Andrew and I were the same age. He's from Texas. I was from up here, obviously. But we, uh, we begin AIM. We begin going to school together. And I soon find out that Andrew is an extreme mama's boy. He has not done the dishes before. He has not done many things before. He's never cooked before. There's never done laundry. He's a great guy. We're still great friends. But there were so many things that he had not yet accomplished chore-wise or other things. So this one day I come home during that first month or so and I walk into the apartment, our apartment, and there's I actually as I'm opening the door, I just there's this kind of just this stench, this very powerful smell. And I open the door and I walk in and there's just smoke. I from like here up, just like really nasty looking smoke. And I'm looking around like, what in the world is happening? I look over at the kitchen. I see Andrew there, and his eyes are kind of wide, and he has a skillet in his hand, and he looks over at me, just kind of this, like, I don't, I don't even know what's happening. I'm, I'm so confused right now. And I look at the skillet that's in front of him, and he has a cup of noodles like this one in the styrofoam on the skillet, <laughs> trying to heat the cup of noodles in the styrofoam on the skillet. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, Andrew, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, obviously. And so I'm trying so hard not just to fall over laughing, but trying to make sure our apartment doesn't blow, uh, burn down. And so I, I show him, I'm like, there's literally instructions on the styrofoam that you're melting. And so we laugh about it. But I can't ever forget that story because the instructions were right in front of him, but yet he didn't know what to do. And so instead of reading the instructions, he just thought he'd wing it. He's like, I know that it needs to be hot, and so I'm going to try to make it hot the way I think it should be hot. And the chaos ensues. And so often we think, I want good things. I want to connect with people. I want to love God. I want to worship God. I want to love my spouse. And we think, well, I'm going to do this the way I think this could work. You know, fire's hot. Put thing on fire. It should work. Well, it doesn't work that way. Well, I want to love my wife, so I'm going to love her this way. Well, how did God say to love her? How did God say and instruct us to love each other? How did God instruct us to worship him? And so we need to follow the instructions, not to be legalistic and lawyers, but just like what Mary said to the servants there, do whatever he tells you. And we are to follow the instructions that are clearly written before us and to clearly follow the signs that Jesus performed, teaching us to be his people. So the servants at the wedding did what Jesus asked and or did what Jesus said and amazing things happened. They took these stone jars, which were quite heavy. They carried approximately 30 gallons of water. And here's um, one of the stones, not from the wedding probably, but from that era, uh, almost 2,000 years ago. And so they filled these things up with water. But these, these jars, these stone jars, were used for the Jewish rites of purification, and so there's a, we're going to dive into some really cool symbolism of why Jesus chose to do this sign this way to teach us things. He, but Jesus uses what the Jews had been using and had even created and altered and, and made complicated. Jesus uses their system, their um, tradition to then accomplish something godly and divine and beyond expectation. So the servants do what Jesus says, and they fill the stone jars to the brim. And this 
idea of being completely filled, uh, I can't help but think of this Greek word called pleroma. And there's a couple pass or several passages in the New Testament that use this word, but it means completely filled. It means to the brim. And here's some passages using the word pleroma. Colossians 1.19 we're talking about Jesus, and he says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That fullness is pleroma. The, to the brim of God was pleased to be in Jesus. Jesus just wasn't godly. He was God. Jesus was completely God. And that is the person at the wedding is God. We also see in Ephesians three sixteen through 20, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you, which is you and me, to be strengthened with power through the, his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness, the pleroma of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. As Christians, as, as those who have received the Spirit through baptism, we are designed to have the fullness of God within us. To have the righteousness of Christ within us. And so we see that Jesus doesn't do things halfway. He doesn't do things 80%. He doesn't do things 99%. Jesus is completely God, and he completely saves, and he completely gives his people what they need to be his people. So I want us to look at some symbolism, the bigger picture here from what then takes place here in this sign, this wedding, this miraculous event the first, again, is that this is public. This is something that Jesus is broadcasting to the world and trying to point towards something. The purpose of a sign is to let you know information and to locate something. If you're looking for McDonald's, you're looking for some big golden arches that make an M. If you're looking for Pizza Hut, you know the exact symbol, the sign that you're looking for. And I'm not just using food symbolism to get you ready to eat potluck. I'm just, uh, I'm just giving you an example. Signs are meant to point towards something. This sign that Jesus is doing is meant to point us towards something, to see a message that he is communicating. He turns the water in the Jewish purification jars into wine. Now, wine has a lot of symbolism in the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament. What we just did a few moments ago, the Lord's Supper, water, um, or not water, sorry, wine, grape juice, the fruit of the vine, is representative, uh, representative of Christ's own blood. And water, or, uh, wine and blood are closely um, symbolic of each other. And so what the Jews were using this water to wash themselves, to wash their hands and sometimes their faces for purification purposes, that, that jar is now full of, of blood, essentially. And it's going to be Jesus' blood. And it's that same wine that he makes that comes from him, that blood, that then makes the wedding better than they could have even imagined. And in the same way, what Jesus has provided for you and me, what we just remembered together, what we have as Christians, his pure blood, it only comes from him, makes this marriage with God, this covenant to God, better than we could even ask or imagine. It's, it's better than what we could have come up with on our own. It's important also to understand from this sign, I mean, Jesus could have just snapped his fingers and made everything that everyone was drinking into the best wine they ever had. But he only does it once the servants have done what he told them 
to do. And then it became the wine that was better than they imagined. And so he uses his those who follow him. He uses those who follow the instructions that he lays out, that his commandments, he uses those who do the things he said to accomplish amazing things, things that come from him. And so as the church, as his people, we are the conduit of God to the world in so many ways. We are a light. We are the salt of the earth. We are his bride. We are one with him. We have his spirit within us. And we bring to the world that only has water, we bring to them the wine that comes from heaven, that comes from Jesus. And it is the responsibility of the church, it is the joy of the church to do what he has asked of us. And he has asked us to love him with all of our hearts, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. He has asked us to follow him and to take up our crosses daily. This sign really happened, turning water into wine. It wasn't a couple hundred years later that people, someone said, I heard a long time ago that somebody somewhere did this. This was written by people that were there that could have been um, fact-checked. You could go and talk to people that were there that had experienced this. It was done in the public for a purpose, and it was recorded for you and I to look back, to, under to see this and say, wow, wow, Jesus, Jesus fills things up to the brim. And he takes what we think is a crisis and he turns it into something beautiful. All of us at some point in our lives, we find ourselves in crisis. And without Christ, life is a crisis because he's our only hope. And only someone like Jesus can turn this water into wine in a public situation. And so we see here that there is none other like Jesus. So this sign really happened, and in conclusion, let this sign fulfill its purpose by let us look to what the sign is pointing to, that Jesus is God, the only God, and as his disciples, he is our God. He has paid the price fully, and he fills us fully with his righteousness. And he has made things better than we can even possibly imagine. If there's any needs here in this congregation, please let them be made known as we stand and sing.